Hello and welcome to the Kim Iverson Show, guys. Thank you so much for being here. Really appreciate it. Um, and we do have a, a great show for you today. We have a, a Dr. Martin Koldorf. Recently, um, Dr. Martin Koldorf was one of the best, well, he is one of the best biostaticians and epidemiolo epidemiologists in the world, but he recently announced that he is no longer a professor at Harvard. And it turns out they fired him. They fired him for speaking out in favor of actual real science during the COVID pandemic. Dr. Koldorf was one of the authors of the Great Barrington Declaration alongside Dr. Sinetra Gupta of Oxford University and Dr. J. Bhattacharya of Stanford University. And if you remember, the Great Barrington Declaration advocated against mass lockdowns and instead for a more measured, targeted approach. And contrary to popular smears, the Great Barrington Declaration did not advise to do nothing during the COVID pandemic, but instead to use well-known, time-tested scientific methods rather than the fear-based methods that people were advocating for. Um, so the Great Barrington Declaration instead advocated for things like focused protection of older, high-risk people while letting low-risk children and young adults live near normal lives to minimize collateral public health damage on education, cancer, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, physical fitness, and mental health, et cetera. Uh, that's just to name a few. We're going to talk to Dr. Martin Kuldorf about his recent firing from Harvard, but first, uh, let's get to our sponsor. Field of Greens is the healthiest thing I do every day, and I want you on this journey with me. It is literally one scoop a day. It tastes great. Now, I love the lemon-lime flavor. It's completely improved my life. This is nutrition the way nature intended. When I take my daily Field of Greens, I notice that I feel more energy. I feel that, uh, you know, my, I, I do notice that I have more color in my skin. You know, I look healthier. I sleep better. I just feel better. And I also crave less junk food. So it's really important. And I love the taste. Um, and what's great about Field of Greens is that each organic fruit and vegetable was medically chosen to support heart and vital organ health. I trust Field of Greens to keep me healthy. I promise you're going to love this product. But if for any reason you don't, they will give you a 100% money back guarantee. I've got 15% off your first order plus free rush shipping. Um, just go to fieldofgreens.com, use the promo code Kim. That is promo code Kim at fieldofgreens.com and get 15% off your first order plus free rush shipping. You will like this stuff. You'll like the taste. I like the taste. I like that it's not a thick, gloopy green drink. I like that it's a like a tea, you know, tea consistency. So it's you just gulp it down, but it tastes good. So lemon lime, that's the way to go. But you know, choose for yourself. Try it out. Let me know how you like it. All right, guys, let's go ahead and get to the show. Dr. Martin Koldorf, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me, King. I want to get into your background a bit uh, before we get into the big story of you no longer being with Harvard. Um, lots going on, it seems like, in, in a variety of ways when it comes to the education system. Um, but tell us about your background. Where are you from? Well, I was born and uh, raised in Sweden, in Northern Europe, uh, just below the Arctic Circle. Uh, so for me, uh, uh, Boston area is tropical, uh, and, uh, <laughs> and then I came to the United States for graduate school, and eventually I worked uh, at the National Institute of Health, at the National Cancer Institute, and I have ended up at, at Harvard uh, a little over two decades ago. Two decades ago, and you're no longer working there? No, they were not very happy with my uh, views about the pandemic. And so, the, so have you just you just announced that you're no longer with Harvard? Is this a recent development? I know the last time I spoke to you, which was about a year ago, um, you were on leave. What has happened since then? Uh, yeah, so this happened some time ago. So they they put me on leave. Uh, 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 so uh, Brigham Women's Hospital, where I worked, they fired me, uh, and because of that, Harvard uh, put me on leave, and then that ended eventually. So, and so, uh, and it ultimately just came down to your your views on COVID. Yes, uh, so they were unhappy with my views and my being outspoken. But uh, uh, the big issue was uh, I insisted that uh, there is uh, infection acquired immunity, which we have known about since 430 BC during the Athenian plague, and these vaccine mandates de facto. Uh, says that no, there's no such thing. 
because they were forcing people with prior uh, COVID vaccines to be immunized. And it was only now recently, I think last week, that on March 5, that finally Harvard removed uh, the vaccine mandates for students. So they were forcing uh, uh, people who had superior immunity from having recovered from COVID to, uh, to get the vaccine. And I think that's unscientific, but it's also unethical. There were many nurses uh, and others who were taking care of patients in the Harvard hospitals and they got infected by COVID. So they were home for a while and then they returned to work, continuing to take care of COVID patients. But then uh, they were fired by, uh, uh, even though they had superior immunity from having had COVID. So instead they should have hired nurses and other who, uh, who had uh, infection acquired immunity because that's superior to vaccine immunity, but they decided to fire them and myself as well. And that's, uh, that's uh, very unscientific, but it's also unethical because let's, for argument's sake, let's assume this is the most wonderful, uh, great vaccine ever. I, I think there are a lot of concerns about it, but let's just for the time being assume that this is the greatest thing on earth. Then uh, you don't want to give it to people who don't need it when there's a shortage of vaccines. You, have to, you want to give it to uh, older people who really need it. And, and when the Harvard uh, mandated vaccines for its young students, who were at low risk no matter what, and of course, even less risk if they already had COVID. Uh, at the same time, there were a lot of older people, including my 87 year old neighbor who hadn't gotten the vaccine yet, who really needed it. Uh, and not just in the US, but in, uh, in other countries, Brazil, Nigeria, India, and so on. So it's sort of, in my view, unethical then to force a vaccine on people who don't need it when there are people who need it, who can't get it because of the vaccine shortage. Right. So even if it was the best vaccine ever and it completely worked um, the way that they thought it would work or hoped it would work, which it didn't end up doing that, but let's just say it did for the sake of argument, then right, there's there's billions of people in the world. And so how many vaccines can you make? How quickly can you make them? You should be shipping them out to all the people who absolutely need them, the people we know who are going to die of the virus versus those who are going to catch it. And like young kids mostly didn't even know they had it when they caught it. You know, they just had like a slight sniffle and that was it versus an elderly person who would end up hospitalized. So you're saying that no matter what, so it was unethical to push it on people. There's, of course, a lot of reasons why it was unethical, but even if it worked really well, it was unethical yeah. to do because there's other people who needed it. Yeah. So even those who are the most uh, pro-vaccine, uh, they should have been against the vaccine mandates because it prevented the uh, a vaccine to reach those who need it the most. What do you think is, you know, for those of us who did not go to Harvard or never were professors at Harvard, you know, could only dream of this. We, we view Harvard and other institutions like this as, you know, the best and the brightest. The, these, are, these are the people who should be the smartest, who should be leading us when it comes to various different, um, you know, science, scientific you know, issues, because our politicians, you know, we're just electing you know, whoever we like, who's got a, gives a good speech or, you know, people or they have a, a name brand because they're a, a business person or something. So we, the, the idea is you should be looking at your best and brightest for, to lead us in a variety of different things. Um, but what Harvard's stance, so you wrote about this in your piece when you said Harvard tramples the truth. Um, that there was a lot of evidence that your home country of Sweden had done it correctly, had approached the pandemic correctly, and yet Harvard continued to push policies without even looking at that data. And you even said in your piece, it's like ignoring the placebo control group when you're when you're you know looking when you're making a recommendation. What is it that has happened at Harvard that makes that that got it to that point where it just was ignoring science and then also to the point where they let you go because you were actually scientific and they were not? Yeah, so that's very surprising and it's very hard to understand exactly uh, why that is because a university should have truth uh, as their motto and Harvard has Veritas, which is Latin for truth as its motto. So then you should follow that. But in this case, uh, uh, people lost their minds. So Harvard uh, was one of the first one to close down its university and sent uh, sort of doing a online 
uh, teaching. And that sort of set the stage. And that was done before there were any government incentive to do it or pressure to do it. So that set the stage for other universities and schools. And uh, we know now that uh, Sweden kept its schools open during that spring of 2020. Uh, so uh, and and childcare. So 1.8 million children from the ages one to 15 were in daycare school uh, that whole spring during the height of the first wave. And of those 1.8 million, exactly zero died from COVID, and there was only a handful of hospitalizations. So we knew that it was safe to keep the schools open. Uh, they also looked at the teachers, and they had the same uh, COVID demand as the average of other professions. So. Unlike influenza, which uh, schools drive a lot of the infections, that's not the case for COVID, and we knew that. And the Swedish Public Health Agency, they put up a, a report in early July, uh, sort of giving this data, this information. And then uh, later, New England Journal of Medicine, which is edited by uh, Harvard professors, uh, they published an evaluation of whether schools should be open or not, and they didn't even mention Sweden. Everybody knew that Sweden had been uh, sort of refused the lockdowns and that schools were kept open there. So uh, uh, you should, of course, look at the, the publicly available data about uh, mortality of kids then and teachers, and they didn't. And as you said, that's like doing evaluating a new drug and not comparing it to a placebo. That's not the way you find truth. So uh, it's very, very surprising, I think. What do you think it is? I mean, so you were one of how many? I, I don't know the the how Harvard works, like the how many people work there or anything like that. But you were what was your title exactly at Harvard? A uh, professor, so I'm a full professor. Of of what? Of medicine. Um, so how many professors of medicine are there at Harvard? Uh, there are many. Uh, I'm sure a few thousand. Oh, a few thousand! So wow. About about the half uh, half the. Uh, faculty at, uh, well, the, uh, thousand, I mean, professors, associate professors and assistant professors. So uh, more than half of the uh, faculty at Harvard are at the medical school. So you were, but you were one of, what percentage would you say um, agreed with you when you came out with the Great Barrington Declaration Along with some other colleagues, and you, you, you were outspoken about, hey, this isn't the right way to go about this. This is, you know, kind of anti-science. Um, how many would you say agreed with you versus didn't agree with you? So I don't have a scientific survey to answer that right, question. Right, of course, which so is yes, guessing. Uh, <laughs> anecdotally, among the my colleagues who I sort of talk to because I have a personal relationship and working with them, I would say the majority uh, was in agreement with me. And uh, I received also many positive emails from uh, faculty members who I had never known before. Uh, they have reached out to me. Um, in, uh, I know several signed the Great Branding Declaration, including one of the former uh, uh, chairs of the Department of, uh, uh, of Ethnology. So uh, there was clearly not a consensus in, at Harvard for the official line of, of lockdowns and these things. Right. So, so then uh, who, but, who's but in people charge? Were speaking, people were afraid of speaking out. And I understand that because uh, you will risk your, your, your livelihood and your family. So I, I complete, some spoke out, uh, uh, some spoke out a little bit and some not at all. And I, I sympathize with all those because it was not very comfortable to speak out. Right. But it doesn't make, but why was it? But, you, you know, if, if so many of you, if there wasn't a consensus, even if it was just a third of you were like, hey, this isn't, I don't think this is the right way to go. And it's not like you were a lone anti-science denier. You know, it's not like you're the one guy who's got like, suddenly you've lost your mind and you're, you're the only one spouting off this and all of everybody else is in consensus. They all agree that there's this, you know, it's, it's, it's not what you're saying. That's not what was going on there. So, and it seems like that wasn't what was going on really anywhere. It seems like at least one third of people everywhere were skeptical of all the things that were done, whether they went along with them or not. We at least know from, you know, of course it's not scientific, but anecdotally, pretty much in every field, just in society, we have learned that about one third have been very skeptical of everything, even if they went along with it. 
I would imagine in the scientific community, it was even higher. I would think just because they were not going along with the science, they were totally anti-science, the measures that were put in place, everything that they wanted to do. Um, so what, who's in charge that made it to where scientists like yourself were afraid, you know, you weren't, I mean, you were very brave and you were outspoken, but others were afraid. Um, what, who's in charge that got to make these kinds of decisions that got to create that sort of environment there at Harvard? So, uh, and I don't think it's specific to Harvard. So I think the same problems are at other universities. <clears throat> and one thing was, is that uh, the NIH director, Francis Collins, and uh, the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, uh, Anthony Fauci, they went out very hard for lockdowns and school closures uh, and, and so on. Uh, and they're not even public health people, they're lab scientists. But they went out very strongly for that. And they sit on the biggest pile of research money in the world. And uh, Anthony Fauci sits on the biggest pile of research money for infectious diseases. So you don't really want to make them upset because that could uh, jeopardize your funding for the future, not just for, for yourself, but for your laboratory, your colleagues, the junior people working in the lab. So uh, you have to sort of then question, do you want to take a risk of upsetting these people who sit on this big pile of money that can fund you? Or will you, uh, uh, will you sort of go against them and risk, risk, risk your future research career? And that's the crux of the problem right there.